Rachel My name is Rachel Williams, and I'm the Outreach Director for the Buckley Program. Today I have the pleasure of introducing Yale Law School professor E. Donald Elliott. He will be moderating our panel on judicial confirmations and interpreting the Constitution. In 1970, Professor Elliott earned his BA from Yale University, and in 1974, he received his JD from Yale Law School. Professor Elliott has been on the Yale Law faculty since 1981 and currently teaches courses in environmental law, energy law, administrative law, and civil procedure. From 1989 to 1991, Professor Elliott served as Assistant Administrator and General Counsel of the United States Environmental Protection Agency, and in 1993, he was named the Julian and Virginia Cornell Chair in Environmental Law and Litigation at Yale Law School the first endowed chair in environmental law and policy at any major American law school. Professor Elliott testifies frequently in Congress on environmental issues and has served as a consultant for the Federal Court Study Committee, which works to improve the relationship between law and science. We are honored to host him here today. Now please join me in welcoming Professor E. Donald Elliott. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Laura Noble and the Buckley Foundation for bringing us, the uh, Buckley Program for bringing us together yeah, here. Yeah. And I, I, I think the topic of this panel, judicial confirmations and interpreting the Constitution, borking activism and originalism uh, is a particularly provocative and uh, perceptive title, I think, uh, Theories of constitutional law and judicial confirmations are often dealt with, but dealt with separately without really recognizing the relationship between them. Uh, and as uh, someone who had Robert Bork as a teacher and later a friend, and Clarence Thomas as a classmate and later a friend, uh, I am particularly interested in this, uh, this topic. We have a very, very distinguished panel to help us discuss this uh, topic, and in, in order to my immediate right, is Randy Barnett, who is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Legal Theory at the Georgetown University uh, Law Center, where he teaches constitutional law and is a frequent and provocative writer on, uh, on these topics. Next to him is Jonathan Turley, who you probably recognize from your uh, uh, television. Uh, Jonathan is a professor at the uh, George Washington Law School, where he's been on the faculty since 1990 and holds the prestigious Shapiro Chair for Public Interest Law there and is a frequent uh, writer and uh, commentator. And our third speaker is Ed Whalen, who is the president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Uh, and he is the uh, author of a recent best-selling book called Scalia Speaks. Um, so, Co-editor, it's Justice Scalia is the author. <laughs> So with that, uh, let me turn it over to uh, Randy, and each of our panelists will make a brief opening statement on the topic, and then I'll give them an opportunity for a little comment on one another's thoughts. Randy. All right, I'm trying to turn this on, but as I push the button, it does not go off the red. So oh, it's on, so. <laughs> got it. Red means on, apparently. It is Yale, after yeah. all. <laughs> Yes, you're making some comment on the Reds in Yale? Yes. Okay, so. Glad it wasn't too subtle. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I was talking to Mike McConnell before um, the conference got started, and he rightly noted that we're the good news panel of the uh, conference. Um, and I think of the three of us, I'm probably going to be the good news speaker of the three of us, because uh, I'm here to say that even though conservatives have a tendency to be kind of get down about things and uh, be a little unhappy about things, there is uh, considerable good news when it comes to judicial nominations, and, I, and you all already know about this. Um, uh, the topic is, uh, is judicial selection, and it, and it mentions Borking uh, uh, and, and what happened to Robert Bork, but I don't assume that all of you know what happened to Robert Bork, and so I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of what happened 30 years ago and contrast that with what happened this year, which you're all old enough to remember what happened this year. All right, so 30 years ago, on June 26th, 1987, Lewis Powell resigned his seat on the Supreme Court, and four days later, uh, on July 1st, President Ronald Reagan nominated former Yale Law Professor and D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals Judge Robert Bork to take his place. Within 45 minutes 
of the nomination, Massachusetts Democrat Senator Ted Kennedy took to the Senate floor with a strong condemnation of Bork. In a nationally televised speech, he declared, quote, Robert Bork's America is a land in which women would be forced to, into back alley abortions, blacks would sit at segregated lunch counters, rogue police could break down citizens' doors in midnight raids, school children could not be taught about evolution, writers and artists could be censored at the whim of the government, and the, donors, and the doors of the federal courts would be shut on the fingers of millions of citizens. It was not until mid-September, some four months later, that the Senate Judiciary Committee convened 12 days of hearings, which were spread over more than two weeks. While the hearings were in session, People for the American Way, a group funded, founded and funded by progressive Hollywood TV producer Norman Lear, aired paid TV commercials narrated by Gregory Peck that attacked Bork as an extremist. Much of the Democrats' focus during these hearings was on Bork's commitment to originalism. In particular, the results they said would, uh, would, ha would flow from employing a consistently originalist methodology, those results that, that uh, Senator Kennedy was referring to in his speech. And it was on the basis of these alleged results that many both inside and outside the Senate would claim that Bork would turn black back the clock on civil rights. On October 23, 1987, some four months after he was nominated, Robert Bork's nomination was rejected by the Democrat-led Senate by a vote of 58 to 42. Tellingly, while two Democrats voted for his confirmation, six Republicans joined with Democrats to vote against him. With Bork's rejection, Justice Powell's seat would eventually be filled by Justice Anthony Kennedy, and the verb to be borked had entered into the political lexicon. If you want a particular moment in time when the politicization of the judicial nomination process began, it was then. Never before had a judicial nomination confronted an organized publicity campaign outside the courtroom, complete with nationally televised ads. Now, some 30 years later, on January 31st, 2017, President Donald Trump nominated Judge Neil Gorsuch to assume the seat vacated by the death of Justice Anthony Kennedy. Hearings on his nomination, held two months later, in March, occupied just four days. On April 7th, a little more than two months since his nomination, Justice Gorsuch was confirmed by a vote of 54 to 45, with two Democrats joining all 52 Republicans. This was truly remarkable. In the wake of the failed Bork nomination, each of the persons Republican presidents had nominated to be justices, Anthony Kennedy, David Souter, John Roberts, and Sam Alito, had abstained from identifying themselves as originalists. And even that originalist stalwart Clarence Thomas did not self-identify as an originalist at the time of his nomination. Unlike all these men, Neil Gorsuch had expressly endorsed originalism as the proper method of constitutional interpretation. Indeed, he had been chosen in part because he had publicly endorsed originalism. So as they had with Bork, Senate Democrats once again sought to make an issue of this commitment. And because Judge Gorsuch stuck to his guns in defense of his originalism, the issue was joined. Yet this time, not only was the result different, so too was popular discourse. And you're all old enough to remember the, the hearings, and you're old enough to remember that the criticisms of Judge Gorsuch based on his originalism never really got any traction. It really wasn't that big a deal. So what happened over the past 30 years to cause this change? Well, in a longer version of this talk, I go through this in some detail, and here we've agreed to keep our remarks between six and eight minutes to start, so I'm only going to be able to suggest what the answer to that is. Uh, and I'm only going to give one answer. One of the obvious answers is that then the, Republic, the Democrats control the Senate, and now Republicans control the Senate, and that does, it for, of course, make a difference. But on the other hand, Senate Republicans had to change the rules governing filibusters in order to win by a 52 or 54 vote majority, and it's not clear, frankly, that they had any taste for doing so. Uh, they didn't really want to give up the filibuster, even though perhaps they should have. And I think had, Bork, had, had the Democrats successfully demonized Judge Gorsuch, I think you would not have been able to keep the caucus together to change the rules, which is what was necessary to actually get it through. And therefore, the failure to demonize turns out also still to be important, even with a Republican-controlled 
Senate. So what caused the difference in 30 years? Well, I'll give you a very short answer. I'll give you the conclusion of the answer without laying out all the evidence for it, and that is originalism as a theory has developed in the last 30 years, and it's been developed by law professors, by legal academics, who have developed the theory in such a way as that it is very, very difficult to credibly criticize the way it used to be able to do. In 1987, there was no theory of originalism. There was a label called originalism that was made up by a Stanford law professor to criticize what folks like Raul Berger and Robert Bork were doing, but there was no theory of what they were doing, and therefore they were very vulnerable to attack. In 30 years, there has developed a theory beginning in the Mies Justice Department and gradually spreading into academia uh, that, that, that changed the theory of originalism and made it more easily defensible. From original framers' intent, now you'll hear judges and jurors talking about original public meaning. That was an innovation pushed by Justice Scalia when he was still on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. And other changes have been made as well. So let me just, in some sense, conclude this by offering the following proof uh, or evidence that, in fact, the uh, public, uh, uh, that, that the fact that acad in academia we have successfully defended originalism. Um, and just by citing to you who it was that testified against Robert Bork in his confirmation hearings. And it was a veritable who's who of big time law professors. Here are the ones whose names would be uh, recognizable to law students today. And I know you all aren't law students, but these are the recognizable names. There were more than these, and it included Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Tribe, Duke Law Professor Walter Dellinger, who was reputed to have advised Judiciary Committee Chairman Joe Biden on what questions to ask Bork. And it's not like Joe Biden was like such an ace questioner that he could have done this on his own. Um, Bork's Yale Law School colleagues Owen Fiss and Paul Gewertz testified against him. David A.J. Richards of the NYU School of Law. Stanford Law Professor Tom Gray. Then USC Law Professor Judith Resnick, who's now on the faculty of Yale Law School. University of Chicago law professor Philip Curlin, then Harvard law professor Kathleen Sullivan, who went on to be dean of the Stanford Law School, and then dean of Northwestern Law School, Bob Bennett. That was then. Now, 30 years later, who testified against Neil Gorsuch? Um, only one law professor testified against Neil Gorsuch on the basis of, or on any basis, including that of his originalism. He's a very, he's a relatively obscure law professor, and now that I've called him an obscure law professor, I'm not going to say who it is, because why insult him? Um, he's, he's a perfectly nice uh, person, uh, but he's, he's not, if I told you what his name was, you wouldn't know who I was talking about. Let's put it that way. So, and then in the public, in public discourse, the only prominent law professor to criticize the nomination, not to testify, but to criticize the nomination was Erwin Shimerinsky, who wrote an op-ed uh, criticizing Gorsuch for his originalism, and the op-ed was in completely internally incoherent. On the one hand, he said, um, you, originalism, you cannot know what it means, it means too many things, and on the other hand, it all, all the results that originalism leads to are bad which of course doesn't go together. If you don't know what originalism means, it can't only lead to bad results. But this didn't stop him in succeeding sentences in his op-ed to say that. So, uh, I, and one of my colleagues, uh, Larry Solem, testified on, on, his, on Just Gors Justice Gorsuch's behalf and defended originalism to the committee. Um, and so that was then and this is now. Uh, and as a result, every judge, uh, every justice who's being not, every judge and justice who's being chosen for the Court of Appeals uh, by this administration has committed themselves to originalism publicly and in fact uh, it is because they've committed themselves publicly that they get the nominations that they've been getting and so it's a big change and I will then and we'll, we'll talk a lot more about that change I think uh, uh, after the last the next two guys talk Jonathan okay uh, the, uh, it, it's funny, I was listening to Randy's comments, and I, I don't know if Bob would be delighted to know that now you can be an originalist. It's sort of like Doug Ginsburg being delighted that now marijuana is legal. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think both of them would say, thanks for getting around to that. Um, the, uh, this is obviously a, um, an unfortunate anniversary. I, as, as Randy noted, is, is likely less optimistic about where we stand on uh, confirmations. I've been very critical of the process. And I'm going to talk briefly about 
a proposal that I've had banging around in the halls of Congress for about 20 years. It's uh, affectionately called the undead uh, uh, bill because it's, it doesn't have enough life to actually truly live, but it's not entirely dead. Uh, and that would be the reform of the U.S. Supreme Court with the expansion of the court to 19 members. I was delighted recently that Richard Posner uh, came on board with that proposal, uh, and uh, that's why it's undead. It just has enough to live, barely. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of things about why I'm less of an optimist in terms of uh, confirmations. I don't view the Gorsuch confirmation as a positive step. Uh, necessarily. I testified in favor of Gorsuch at the confirmation hearing with Professor Sullivan. Uh, and um, to me, the difference really was that the Republicans were in control of the Senate. Uh, the Democrats were in control uh, when uh, Bork uh, became a verb, a noun, and an adjective, uh, joining a rather short list of Rube Goldberg and Herman Rorschach of people who actually made that leap into grammar. Uh, but I don't think we've seen a lot of improvement. I think Randy's point is a very good one about uh, the nature of the criticism at the confirmation, but much of it was rather muted because of the majority control of the GOP. To me, there's two uh, things that you can pick from this anniversary that are still matters of concern. One is the politicalization of the confirmation process, which Randy ably described. Um, the that is nothing necessarily new. I mean, the Bork controversy really represented a quantum shift, perhaps, in the level of politicalization, the viciousness. You know, they even, you know, if you remember, published Bork's video selection his, of that uh, videos he rented. They don't remember. Uh, but um, it turns out, it, it turns, yeah, it turns, it turns out that the guy had a truly boring and questionable uh, taste in movies. Um, <laughs> You have to first tell them about videotapes and how you used to rent yes, them in there, stores. There, there was this thing called that. videotapes. I will explain <laughs> later. Um, but actually, there were such cases. You know, Tyler, uh, who, was, who was called by his critics his accidency uh, when he came into power uh, after the death of his predecessor, uh, tried nine times to get Baldwin on the court uh, and failed. It wasn't until Bork, uh, I, I'm sorry, to Polk, that um, uh, Baldwin actually was put on the court. Uh, there have been raw political disputes in that sense. Uh, Kennedy actually came out with the highest of the current margins on the court. He got on by a, a vote of 97 to 0. Uh, the worst margin, of course, still is held by Clarence Thomas. Uh, but uh, Clarence Thomas was 52-48. Um, Gorsuch really didn't do much better than that. He got 45, 55 to 45. Um, and it is true that the character of the hearing was very different, uh, and I think Randy's right on about that. I, the second problem is the one I wanted to quickly address, because I never pass up an opportunity to pitch this idea. Uh, when it comes to Supreme Court, size is everything. Um, that, um, you know, I believe our court is demonstrably too small. We have the smallest Supreme Court of any major nation. And the result is that we have this huge concentration of power on the court that I think would have mortified the framers. You know, this is a court that began with six members when they met in the Royal Exchange Building in New York. Only two showed up, by the way. Um, it went to seven members in 1807. It went to nine members in 1837. It went to 10 members in 1863. The reason for the fluctuation was that when a new circuit was added, they would add a justice because they would ride circuit. Uh, eventually, by really historical accident, we ended up with a nine-member court. And I did a study of this and concluded that nine is one of the worst possible numbers you can come up with for a court. And ever since we went to nine, we've had the problem of a court of one embodied most uh, vividly with Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, where those of us who also covered the court would spend all summer debating whether how O'Connor felt about the death penalty, uh, abortion, and she would change, and she would come back, and that would change the law. And it was mortifying that that degree of power rested in a single justice. Other countries n were particularly aware of this problem, and they insisted on larger courts. The uh, United Kingdom has a greater uh, circulation of, of justices, but they have 12. 
Japan has 15, Israel has 15, uh, Germany has 16, India has 31, Spain has 74, France has 124. That's only because most don't come back from lunch. Um, now, what I, what I was suggesting uh, was an expansion to 19 members, and I have a wicked addition to that. Uh, and I won't get into the details of graduating this up. No, no president has all of these seats. And that is, um, I think we should go back to, to justices essentially riding circuit. I think that two justices every year should have to sit by designation on lower courts. Like everyone on this panel, I speak to judicial conferences all the time. And without question, every single conference, a judge says, what is it with the Supreme Court? It's like they have no concept of what it is to judge cases, to resolve cases. Things come back from the Supreme Court and they're more nuanced and impossible to follow than when they arrived. Um, I actually think there's a value to having justices sit on lower courts, to apply the doctrines that they are creating. So that would give us an operating court of 17 which is about this, a little smaller than most in-bank courts on the circuit level. Uh, now, th the benefit of that would not just be the reduction of the concentration of authority, uh, but, um, just keep track of my time, but also it would bring, I hope, a greater uh, quality to nominees. Uh, the reason I testified in favor of Neil Gorsuch is that I considered him to be the gold standard. Uh, he was an intellectual replacing an intellectual, and I could not uh, understand people that were opposing him uh, because they simply didn't like the outcome of his logic. Uh, but the chances of getting a Gorsuch or, better, or, or you know, Brandeis or a Holmes is completely accidental in most confirmation hearings. We have gone to what I've called a blind date nominee. These, these positions are so few, and this is how the logic that Washington works under, that we can't afford to ask them tough questions and we can't afford to pi find people with strong opinions. So Senator Day O'Connor was selected. The senator that selected her went into Reagan's office and said, I've got the perfect nominee. She is a, quote, empty portfolio. The Democrats will not be able to do anything. And she is, is, is not alone. You know, they look for nominees who have never uttered a single interesting thought or written an interesting thing in their lives. And then if we end up with a Brandeis, it's a bonanza. But that's how this small court is distorting this process and the confirmation hearings themselves have become distorted. Uh, they have the substance of a slurpee. They, no one asks serious questions and serious answers are not given. Uh, Roberts is a good example of that. I practiced around Roberts when he was an appellate judge. When he was at the confirmation hearing, I said, thank God, this guy is going to finally bring substance to the confirmation process. And they asked him, what's your judicial philosophy? And he said, I think a justice should be like an umpire. And the senator said, you mean like a baseball umpire? And he said, yes, like a baseball umpire. And one of the senators said, you mean like calling balls and strikes? And he said, yes, like standing behind a plate and calling balls and strikes. <laughs> and this went on for about an hour till I was trying to snap my neck. Uh, because it was so vacuous, okay? But he was the perfect nominee, including having the perfect family. He was perfect. Roberts looks perfect. When they walked in, I turned to the producer and said, my God, Carl Rove is raising them hydroponically in the basement. <laughs> this, you know, this guy is perfect, right? Well, that's what nominations have become. You get brilliant guys like Roberts who talks like an idiot because that's what he's told to do. And I, I actually think Gorsuch held back. Gorsuch had a lot more to offer, and he was reciting things that were told to him, and he was told that that's what you have to do. I think if we have a larger court, maybe we can get back to actually having serious nominees and serious confirmations. I think Gorsuch just happens to be a gold star nominee, but I wouldn't count on that. Thank you. Ed? Uh, thank you. I'd like to address the broader sweep of the uh, judicial confirmation process, both for the Supreme Court and for the lower courts over the last 30 years, and uh, with some additional time, supplement um, some of what Randy had to say. 
I think what we really see, um, what, what happened back during the Reagan administration is the left mobilized against Ronald Reagan's judicial nominations. That culminated in the Bork defeat, but it happened as well with a lot of lower court judges. So whereas previously uh, no one had really cared about judicial nominations and senators would adopt a, a practice of, of uh, invoking the principle of deferring to the president, suddenly uh, Democrats especially were driven by their base to fight against uh, President Reagan's judicial nominations. Now, oddly enough, it took Republicans, or conservatives rather, some time to mobilize back. Um, I'd like to contrast two sets of Supreme Court nominations. Uh, there's a great uh, number of parallels between them. In 1993 and 1994, when I was uh, a staffer for the Senate Judiciary Committee, I was a lead staffer on the Ginsburg and Breyer nominations. Uh, there you had a uh, newly elected Democratic president who had taught constitutional law, who, who was charismatic, who had a, uh, a, a uh, Democratic majority in the Senate, and who was blessed with the gift of two Supreme Court vacancies in his first two years in office. He selected Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer in 1993 and 1994, and the operative uh, mode for Senate Republicans was to roll over and play dead. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was confirmed 96 to 3. I don't have time for all the stories I could tell you, but let me just say that, that they, the, goal of the, the goal was to make that hearing boring. Republicans had pre-committed to confirming her even before they reviewed her record. The whole idea was to make sure that nothing controversial came up during that hearing. Stephen Breyer was confirmed a year later, 87 to 9. Uh, he actually had a lot of opposition um, uh, from the left, from Howard Metzenbaum, among others, so the, the votes um, all ended up coming from Republicans, including, uh, of all folks, uh, the uh, senator from Indiana, um, who years later, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting his name now. Um, I'm sorry? No, no, no. No. Republican. Oh, Republican. Luger. Luger. Luger, who years later said he had never voted against any um, uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, nominee. Um, in any event, if you fast forward 16 years, you have a newly elected Democratic president who had taught constitutional law, who was actually viewed as charismatic back then, remember, uh, who was uh, blessed with the gift of two vacancies in his first two years in office. Uh, and uh, what's more, his very first nomination was the first Hispanic nominee to the Supreme Court ever. I tell you, if you had asked anyone back in 90, 1993, 1994, what would happen in such a case? It would be Republicans roll over and play dead. Now instead, uh, there was substantial opposition to Sonia Sotomayor's nomination. I believe the uh, final vote was 68 to 31. Um, and uh, there was actually a, a challenge to her on grounds of judicial philosophy. Now, there's only so much one can expect of senators. I'm not going to uh, make the claim that it was a, a, a compelling a, a case that was put together all that well, but completely different tenor than 1993. Likewise, uh, the following year, 2010, when Elena Kagan was confirmed, she again uh, received more than uh, 30 votes against her. So what happened? In the meantime, the conservative base had mobilized. It had mobilized um, in favor of judicial nominations during the Bush 43 administration, first for the lower courts, then for Roberts and Alito, and it was ready to, to, to um, force senators to do something they don't want to do, oppose uh, nominees of, of a Democratic president. Now, when you look at this broader sweep, you also see that for a long time, tools that were theoretically available to um, the opposition were never actually used. The filibuster, in theory, had been available for a long time. It wasn't until 2003 that Senate Democrats um, launched this unprecedented uh, partisan campaign of filibusters. And of course, um, you then had them try to use the filibuster against um, uh, Neil Gorsuch earlier this year. Um, likewise, you've seen an expansion of the so-called blue slip privilege, the, the exercise of a home state senator to basically say, you know, I can block, uh, I, I have a veto power over anyone who's nominated to a position in my state. The 
blue slip is best defended, um, I think, as an exercise of a home state senator's power to make sure that his political enemy doesn't preside over his corruption trial. Um, and for that reason, it's, it's, it's best, um, again, best justified um, when it's not used ideologically, but again, instead against a political opponent, to a district court seat. What would happen over the years is the blue slip metastasized. It expanded to courts of appeals. It expanded uh, in force um, to, to become a, a sort of veto power. At some points, it's just been given weight. And so you uh, now see um, we're in a situation, um, and of course Republicans use the blue slip against Democrats too, I want, want, want to make clear, but we're, we're talking about just doing away with the blue slip altogether now that's been being used in a much more um, muscular way. You've also seen uh, the extension of the battle uh, that had first started um, with um, Bork on the Supreme Court, and again, some with the other Reagan judges, but it's now a routine feature of the Courts of Appeals. You look at these wonderful nominees this last week. Stellar credentials. Uh, I, I believe in every single case there were more than 40 votes um, against them. Perhaps, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so pretty much a party line vote. You see a party line vote uh, in, in committee uh, as well. And you've seen the battle extend to the district courts. Um, uh, where now um, the, 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 the fight is over you know, uh, nominations that previously were viewed as, um, as obscure. I'm going to um, wrap up by just supplementing a friendly modification to, to uh, uh, well, to, to a couple of final points. First, what happened over the last 30 years? Um, one part of the answer is Antonin Scalia. Um, we, we see so much has happened over the last year plus as, a, as a, 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 a testament to his legacy, the fight to keep the seat open, Neil Gorsuch paying homage to Justice Scalia. You have these two wonderful former Scalia clerks confirmed just this week. Uh, yes, uh, academics have done a great job in, in advancing originalist methodology. Justice Scalia did a wonderful job practicing it, and I think uh, his um, great legacy explains the, the the, the greater, much of the greater respect that originalism has. Um, the final point I would make is um, one big change since 1987, as well as say the internet equalizes. I began blogging in 2005 precisely because I didn't want uh, to, to have happen to President Bush's Supreme Court nominees what happened to Robert Bork. There was no opportunity to, to uh, respond to or dismantle the, the false claims that the media just ate up. And now uh, you can, uh, this has happened back in 2005, it's happened since. I have reporters calling me to understand more fully the records of nominees, be able to just demolish false claims before they get traction. Uh, and so the internet uh, has, has made this a much more public game, so to speak, where there are opportunities um, to uh, weigh in and, and correct the bias of the left that's so easily fed through the media. So I'll leave it there and uh, can continue the conversation. Let me start by asking Randy and Jonathan if they'd like to make any comments on points that others have made. Yeah, first of all, I, just, I want to basically agree with Ed um, uh, and, and underscore what he had to say. I only in my, uh, my time had time to mention the theoretical development of an originalism, but I also did mention that Justice Scalia was the person that made the first big theoretical move from original framers intent to original public meaning, and he is a former academic um, who formulated this idea while he was an academic, uh, and so he does deserve credit uh, uh, for the the academic development of originalism. Uh, secondly, um, it's true that the idea of originalism developed in a way that made it much more difficult to criticize, but there are other two, two other developments uh, that Ed has alluded to that were extremely important. One was the development of the Federalist Society, which was founded here at Yale and a number of other schools, um, uh, which has created an infrastructure for conservative uh, constitutionalism, including the development of a bench from whom conservatives could be chosen uh, to be on the courts. Uh, that, ha that has been of immeasurable value, including the fact that the, that the people who are making judicial selections now are people who have come out of that um, uh, framework, who've come out of that institutional milieu. That's hugely important, cannot possibly be underestimated. Without that, we would not be seeing this. And then finally, Ed Whalen himself. 
um, on bench memos and what he's prepared to do in terms of rebutting each and every scurrilous and baseless at, uh, attack that's being made on these judges uh, by the left and essentially exploding them before they can get off the ground. Um, and he does so uh, online where you can be done in real time and he's just a hero when it comes to uh, uh, debunking some of the criticisms that have been made. Um, and he's not alone. There are other people who are doing it as well. But that's the part that I think also needs to be stressed. Um, I guess the only other thing I would, I would mention, uh, my only disagree, uh, well, two things about what Jonathan said. First of all, um, without pursuing the merits of his particular proposal, let me say, get ready, get ready. If the Democrats take control of the Senate and the House and the presidency, they will expand the size of the Supreme Court. They will try to do that. Um, they have to get control of all three branches to do that because, it's, because it can merely be done by legislation, but you have to be able to have pass it, you have to pass it out of both houses, it has to be signed by the president. Uh, and that's going to happen, um, and, and it's already being discussed, that's how I'm so confident that it will happen, because they are not going to like the current makeup of the court when at the end of the Trump administration, and, and this is gonna be the best way they can to reverse it quickly. So keep in mind, that is on its way. Uh, the second thing is that, that Jonathan mentioned how the nominees were chosen uh, who didn't say anything or didn't believe anything, and I do agree that John Roberts certainly fit that, um, that description, but that was because they, had to, they were chosen as stealth candidates. Um, and I think the, the departure that, for, that the, the Gorsuch nomination represents and the other nominations that are being appointed to the Court of Appeals is that they are not stealth candidates. That has changed. And so you have to account for the fact that even without expanding the court to 19 members, we are now getting nominees that stand for something and have a track record and actually are being chosen because, by the White House because they have a track record. That's different than previous Republican administrations, and we have to take a bigger picture to figure out how that, why that is happening and how it's possible to succeed. John? Um, uh, first of all, I just want to note for my other panelists that I did bring one technique from confirmation hearings today, and that is I brought my daughter, which is an old confirmation trick, so you put your family in the front row. <laughs> and so any disagreement you may have with me, you've got to say something really nice beforehand or you'll do great emotional damage to my daughter. <laughs> um, that's warning, both these gentlemen. Uh, the, uh, Randy already passed the test. That was very nice. Uh, the, um, I just want to note a couple things. First of all, Gorsuch is actually quite, quite interesting in terms of the comparison to Borg uh, because he's, he has a depth of analysis that is grounded in the sort of counter-majoritarian concern with the court uh, that with originalism was a, a great thrust of, of, of Robert Bork. Um, he also, I think, is in many ways broader. Uh, he has a, a, a deep uh, understanding of textualism, the importance of not just constitutional interpretation, but legisprudence on how to interpret legislation. Now, in terms of, is, does, it, does any of this suggest we're going to get back into merits-based nominations? I would say don't bet on it. I, we, you know, I think that the fact that the Republicans controlled the Senate meant that they could bring more value-added uh, justices to the nomination process. Uh, but the small number of seats on the court will continue to distort, in my view, uh, the confirmation process and who is nominated. If you take a look at the people that have been on the court in the last 25 years, a significant number uh, have been these blind dates. I mean, they basically found Souter living in the woods. Uh, <laughs> You know, of New Hampshire. I mean, he was like a hermit. Uh, there was a there was a memo that went to the White House where they actually described books in whatever hut he lived in uh, to try to understand what it is that he believed. Um, you know, Kagan had the smallest publication record of any academic I've ever right. seen. Right. Uh, so, it, except for uh, one area in which she did do a substantive piece on, she was basically a blank slate. And that's going to continue to be the case as, as control, you know, uh, is, it fades. Now, the, the filibuster change, I think, is a big change in that sense. This, Gorsuch would not have made it through, obviously, uh, if they had not shot, uh, decided to shoot the filibuster rule. Yeah, the abolition of the filibuster uh, creates all sorts of opportunities um, for um, this administration if um, the vacancies arise and we hold the Senate. 
Um, basically, what you've, you've had with the abolition of the filibuster, first to the lower courts in November 2013, and then for the Supreme Court, is a, a dramatic move um, uh, towards um, enhancing the, the power of simple majority control. And so, uh, conversely, if you lose that majority, you're buried. Uh, I mean, if, uh, if the Senate is somehow lost next year, um, how many confirmations will there be during the ne next two years of the Trump administration? Hardly any. So, um, uh, it's very, very stark how, how important uh, this majority control is. Again, we saw this in the difference between Scalia and Bork. People say, oh, um, how is it that, that, that so much changed in one year? With Scalia being confirmed unanimously in, in, in 1986 and Bork being defeated in 1987. Well, that misses, first of all, that the, the Senate flipped in the 1986 elections. It also misses that the Democrats went after Rehnquist in 86. Remember what happened back then is Rehnquist was being elevated to Chief Justice and uh, Scalia was being um, nominated to Rehnquist's vacancy. If you defeat Rehnquist, you knock out Scalia as well. Uh, so that was the strategy back then. It, 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 it didn't work, but it was uh, uh, you know, in, in, entirely uh, sensible. I thank Randy for his kind comments about my work and I certainly second uh, his remarks about the incredible impact that Federalist Society has had in uh, transforming the process. Thank you very much. We have about 20 minutes for questions. How about here, up in front? <clears throat> Thank you. So um, what should we make of Merrick Garland and the and then there's the delaying action that happened? Is this a like Republicans just answering the call put forward by Democrats? Is this an escalation or is this like not even quite answering the level that we had seen with things like Bork and Rehnquist and the others? If I, if I may address that, um, President Obama's former White House counsel, Catherine Rumler, uh, in a discussion with me, conceded that she would have recommended if, if the scenario had been uh, switched that uh, Senate Democrats do exactly what Senate Republicans did. This was what, what Joe Biden had recommended way back in, or had threatened way back in 1992. It's what Chuck Schumer was threatening in 2007, more than a year before the election. This was baked into the system. What was unique about the vacancy um, that, that arose uh, with Justice Scalia's death in February of 2016 is that this is the first time in a long time that you had had a, um, a vacancy arise when you had the president of one party and the Senate controlled by the other. So what happened uh, was, I think, entirely predictable. Uh, I think it was entirely right for Senate Republicans to act as they did, and it's um, uh, not, not incidentally uh, yielded hu uh, huge benefits. Um, I, I, on this, I, I think I'm going to have to disagree with Ed. Look, I'm delighted that Gorsuch is on the Supreme Court, uh, I, uh, and uh, but I felt that uh, Merrick Garland deserved a vote. Mm -hmm. um, I thought if the Republicans were going to to stand on uh, this issue uh, that Ed has ap aptly described, they should have voted him down. Uh, they should have given him the vote. I think it's a bad precedent. Uh, I think they treated him unfairly. It's one thing to say, look, we are going to vote on issues surrounding your nomination. Uh, but to not give him a vote, I think, did break from departure. I think that of the contemporary justices, the average uh, delay in a vote was, I think, 68 days, if you look at the, if the, the modern court. It gets longer because Louis Brandeis was really long. It was like 130 days or something like that. Uh, but I thought that they should have voted him in. I mean, the fact is we all knew from the outset that it wouldn't happen. You know, the worst thing in Washington is when everyone has nothing but good things to say about you. Um, you know that's either your eulogy or a failed nomination. Uh, and, you know, when, when I woke up the next morning and everyone was heaping praise on Merrick Garland, I thought, that poor guy, uh, he will never see a vote. But I think he should have had a vote. Uh, very briefly, I, I was classmate of Merrick's. Uh, he was in my small section, not my small, we had big sections then. He was in my section at Harvard Law School, and it was, he was one of the uh, most brilliant students in our section. He was one of the most outspoken uh, and smartest students there. He's a fine Court of Appeals judge. Uh, I think it would have been wholly unfair to Merrick Garland to give him a hearing, uh, because at that hearing, at that, and I think he would not have enjoyed the 
the experience of having been given a hearing because at that point all the interest groups would have come out to try to do him in externally to the hearing and in the hearing room the Republicans would have been obligated if they were going to vote against him and Jonathan admits they would have to justify that vote by developing negative things about him in the hearing. Uh, it would have been a very unpleasant pros uh, prospect for him. It would not have helped his reputation in the slightest. Uh, his reputation now is, if anything, better than it was before. He's a household name in a positive way. Um, and uh, uh, the outcome would have been the same. It's, it would, and my, what I said to him uh, is that, you know, this is not about him. This is about the Republicans deciding as a matter of principle that you may disagree with, but it was a matter of principle to let the election decide who the next nominee was going to be because we had an impending election, a opening in the, in the presidency because of term limited presidents, which are a good thing, um, and now the electorate could make the pivotal decision as to what the direction of the future direction of the Supreme Court would be, and in fact, the election probably turned on this issue. This is not. This was not a superfluous issue. I doubt seriously if Donald Trump would have been elected if it hadn't been for the vacancy on the Supreme Court, and that's essentially how our system is set up to run. And it was better for Merrick Garland that the decision be, was made on the basis of that rather than trying to drag him through the mud. Quick comment by Ed Whalen, and then yeah. get to more questions. Sure, I also admire Merrick Garland. Um, I, I disagree with Jonathan on the precedent, because it depends on how you define the, the, the features of the precedent. Again, there had not been a situation where you had a president making a nomination to a, a Senate controlled by the opposite party. That had happened on the lower courts as recently uh, as 2007, 2008, as well as um, in the last couple of years. What did the Democrats do in 2007, 2008? They didn't hold hearings on these nominees. They had no act, took no action at all. And frankly, that's the um, politically sensible route to take. No senator is going to want to start a dynamic in place that creates a, a, a momentum that could undermine what they're doing. Other questions? Sir. Hello. So the uh, blue slip process has been in the news lately with uh, David Strass's nomination to the Eighth Circuit and Senator Franken opposing it, and also due to the uh, often overturned Ninth Circuit and Sixth Circuit, which got overturned by the Supreme Court on ideological grounds. Now, Mr. Whelan has made his thoughts on the blue slip process quite clear. I was wondering if uh, Professor Turley or Professor Burnett may weigh in and then respond to his comments. Blue slip. Can I go back, please? With blue slipping? Yeah. yeah. What, what, what's your I mean, I, I've been opposed to blue slipping for years. I wrote a column about it, I think, about 10 years ago, saying that I thought it was a uniquely bad tradition that should have ended back then. I find it absolutely perverse. It actually is a way for senators to cash in on judicial no, uh, uh, nominations. Uh, and they've used blue slipping, in my view, almost uniformly for the wrong reason. Uh, they've either used blue slipping because they're trying to pressure the White House on a collateral or extrinsic issue, um, or they're trying to force something that they really want, including a nominee, like a, in one case the son of a senator, or in other cases friends of senators. Um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a really corrupt process. I, I just don't, I, I, I'm surprised it's lasted this long. Uh, very briefly, uh, the Senate has a, a number, and actually the House does too, but mostly the Senate has a number of uh, counter-majoritarian features to it that have developed over the years in order to prevent it from, quote, becoming like the House, in which a bare majority basically gets their way and that's that. And these can be positive. These can be useful. The problem is when they're abused. And as a result of consistent abuse by one side, then the other side, then the other side, and a tit for tat uh, that goes back, and then there's a debate as to who started what, but you know, you're all talking about things that happened 30, 40 years ago. As a result of all of this, we, have effect we had effectively created a super majoritarian uh, requirement to get it on the court, and in this case, an individual senator could block somebody from being on the court as a matter of of course, as a matter of course, and that is not the way the Senate was set up to function. So when you abuse these procedural protections, then you're going to find eventually those procedural protections are going to go away, as they have and as I think they should. Other questions? Here's one here. Uh, on your proposal, Professor Turley, about expanding the court to 19 or whatever other number, um, how is that different, and how would you defend against the, you know, if, if in fact one party controls the White House and the Congress and the courts, that that isn't packing the court? Right. Like yeah, actually, that before. was in, in my academic uh, piece. I went into uh, the FDR uh, 
um, analogy. I think that FDR had the right idea um, for the wrong reason. And first of all, his his plan for the Supreme Court was absolutely moronic. You know, he tied uh, his right to, to to appoint additional. Uh, justices based on their age, and it just happened to be the age that all the horsemen that he was trying to uh, get rid of or dilute just happened to be on the other side of that line. It was a really dumb uh, proposal. I, under my uh, uh, plan, no, no president would have more than two nominations per term until we went up to a full uh, court so that this would be spread over about 20 years. I, and then you would end up with a with a, an active 17 member court. Um, I don't actually, but what Randy was talking about, I'm not as confident that the Democrats are going to do this. Um, I proposed this when the Democrats had uh, power in the Senate, I, and um, I'm not too sure they would. I'd be delighted if they would. As they're not going to do the way you. They're not going to do it the way you want it to be done. They're going to do it so they can appoint all of them. They're not going to go two per. I, I per doubt. Term. I, I got to say, I doubt that. I mean, I. I I'm not best friends with a lot of the Democratic senators, but I know a lot of them, and I'd be surprised if, if uh, a sizable number went forward on a muscle play like that. Um, I don't think it is something that they would likely get the, uh, a full uh, um, team of Democrats to vote for. If they did, I would join Randy in opposing it. But in my proposal, it's, it's, it is a process by which we ramp up to an act of 17 plus two uh, court, and that's about I think the right size. You can differ on the number of, of justices, but if you take a look at how Court of Appeals operate in the in-bank mode, um, you don't see a lot of the problems people talk about, like multiple opinions and, every, and slowing down the process. Judges tend to have a very strong cultural norm uh, to, to try to reach agreements, and if you look at in-bank decisions, they don't have a, a plethora of, of opinions that come out of there. They try to 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 um, to reach some consensus. All the way in the back. So a quick comment and then a question. Um, it seems to me what one factor that's been left out is that Bork was replacing Justice Powell, swing vote. Scalia was replacing Chief Justice Berger, another conservative. Merrick Garland is replacing would have been replacing Scalia, right? So. The, the inflection point is there would have been a five-justice conservative majority with Bork. There goes Roe and not any number of other cases. Merrick Garland would have meant, and the New York Times acknowledged, Merrick Gar Garland would have meant a five-justice liberal majority as long as Justice Ginsburg remained on the court. And you should add that uh, Neil Gorsuch was replacing Scalia. So just Correct. Like Gorsuch support is your only point. replacing Scalia. So right. my thesis is it's control and the balance of the court. We have had 414 courts for most of my lifetime as a lawyer. My question is for Ed Whalen. If Kennedy goes next, so Kennedy retires, but the Democrats uh, and the Democrats don't control the Senate, how many, how big does the Republican majority have to be to defeat the public relations campaign hmm. that the Democrats will wage against any conservative successor to Kennedy? We will win that battle. Um, under the scenario that you describe, um, there are any number of, uh, not, of candidates with outstanding records um, who, if we have a uh, retain the Republican majority, that was your scenario, will sail through. Uh, the, 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 the best thing about the Gorsuch confirmation process was the abolition of the filibuster. I was cheering for Democrats to be as stupid as they turned out to be. Um, that, that is the long-term victory we have. Yeah. Now look, you know, there are some folks, I mean, the Republican coalition uh, is not entirely unified. You have to worry about you know, two or three of the members keeping them on board. But there are plenty of candidates um, uh, you can find um, who, who won't threaten to, to, to splinter it. So look, we have been winning the battle um, over, in, in terms of the fight over the role of the Supreme Court, we've been, we've been winning that uh, time after time after time. And, you know, uh, uh, Randy's uh, and, and, and Jonathan's left-wing uh, colleagues in academia decry the fact that, that we keep winning this rhetorical battle. Um, they think it's just rhetoric, um, or I think we have the underlying ideas. But, no, I'd love that scenario. And um, it's a battle that we can win and should win. In defense of my colleagues, you know, there's not just a left wing at Yale. There's also a far left wing. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, 
Any other questions? Sir. Yeah, hi. So um, it seems to me that one of the factors that's made the um, uh, confirmation hearing so political is that the court is far more powerful than it probably ever should have been. So uh, Professor Barnett, I'm just curious in terms of your recent proposals in your recent book about having maybe a slightly more muscular, energized court, how do you think that would affect the process? Well, I do think that the, that the court has been perceived as being political in part because um, we have had living constitutionalism that has predominated as a judicial philosophy for, through, from the Warren Court forward. I, I happen to agree with many of the Warren Court opinions and what many of the Warren Court decisions, not the opinions, the decisions. Where I disagree is in the opinions that uh, justified it. And it did, they did start to write judicial opinions that sounded like this is a good idea, therefore it's constitutional, or this is a bad idea, therefore it's unconstitutional. Um, uh, it is so ordered. Uh, and uh, that invites the public to view the court as political. Um, uh, so there's that. Secondly, um, our actual system, our actual constitutional system does presuppose um, that a political president is going to be selecting, a politically elected president is going to be selecting nominees that will be confirmed by a politically elected Senate. So politics is baked into the system. What has changed in recent years, what has changed from the 1980s now, um, is, the, is the lack or the disappearance of a consensus, a post-New Deal consensus as to how the Constitution should be interpreted that was shared by Democrats and Republicans. And with the rise, with the election of Ronald Reagan um, and the revival of constitutionalism on the right, not by everybody, but by a critical mass of people on the right, you then actually had a debate for the first time. You had a debate about how the Constitution should be interpreted. And when that debate exists, in our, in our system, it's going to be reflected, or it ought to be reflected, um, in the political process by which presidents are elected, nominees are selected, and nominees are confirmed. And so this, uh, even though it may have been triggered in the first instance by what looked like a politically active court, um, I think it has baked into the cake of uh, a political system in which there, when there is a disagreement about judicial philosophy, and the one thing I agreed with Joe Biden about during the Bork nominations is the judicial philosophy is relevant to whether someone's qualified right. to be on the court. It doesn't just matter how, how, what good grades you have, but it also matters how you view your job as a judge. If that's true, then that's going to ultimately be decided politically. We have time for one more question. Sir. Hi. Uh, my question was to the whole panel. Um, I know you mentioned about, I believe it was Professor Tribe feeding questions to Senator Biden on the constitutional interpretation philosophy. How viable do you see that as a strategy for improving the nomination process of if you will, educating senators on how they need to approach these to improve the nomination process. Senators behave as they do because they have incentives to behave that way. Um, there, there's a reason why, say, a senator will ask 10 questions about Indian law that he doesn't possibly understand. It's because people back in his home state want him to ask those questions. So no, there are very few senators who are going to uh, want to um, uh, and, and who'll be competent at, at asking the, the, the really tough questions and then have to do the follow-up. Have you seen, ever seen a senator try to do follow-up? Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't think there's a lot of uh, prospect for dramatically improving uh, the quality of questioning. Um, actually, I think there are a number of very good uh, Senate Republicans now on the committee who would be very deaf questioners. Uh, on the Democratic side, things have been pretty dismal. I, I, agree. Comment by Randy. I, I agree with Ed that, the, that, first of all, the quality of questioning by the Republican side has gotten better with some certain additions to the Judiciary Committee, uh, Lee and Cruz and others. Uh, that's new. Uh, but other than that, these the senators on both sides are just capable, they're just not well, they're just not well equipped to ask substantive questions. They don't know enough themselves. They're just not competent to do it. As Ed uses the word competent. I was reminded by this in the Gorsuch nomination hearings with, when Senator Feinstein, uh, no, Senator Feinstein, um, was it? No, I think it was Feinstein. Was Feinstein on the judiciary? She's not on the judiciary. We have to okay. say what she said. When, when, when Feinstein 
uh, started questioning Judge Gorsuch, and she held in her hand a letter uh, uh, that was questioning his originalism, and she started to read the beginning of, the, it would obviously have been sent to her by some law professors, and she started to read the beginning of the letter to formulate the question, and she sort of gave up halfway through the paragraph and just changed the subject to something else. She couldn't even get through her own question uh, in order to ask this tough question, having been fed from the previous day a good question from law professor who'd been watching the hearings, she couldn't even ask it. because she's, she one, of the, she's one of the smartest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 th I actually think that there, there are a number on both sides that are smart enough to engage in the uh, conversation. I admit that there are many that um, It's not their not. intelligence, it's their knowledge. Yes, yeah. and um, I remember, I think it was Thomas, when one of the senators said, what's this I hear about you being a neo uh, like I thought you were a Baptist. Uh, the, um, <laughs> so obviously there's, uh, there's, mis there's misfires. Um, I, and, and I think that, that all of us have been, I think everyone at this table has probably been asked by senators to give questions at confirmation. Uh, it is a terrible thing when you hear your question actually used right. uh, and you, you realize you'll burn in hell for this. But, um, uh, by what actually comes out. But um, on the off chance that members of our panel might at some point um, be nominated to something, I'm going to call a halt to this, okay. partly because of the. <laughs> before of before you spend too years. much more time beating up on the Senate. Uh, no, it's really a time question. Thank, thank, let's thank our panel for an excellent discussion.